This is part five of the Zero Carbon Coach training program. No, um, so who do we have? Katie's here, Scott is here, Nicole is here, Colleen's here, Karen's here, and Cindy, right? So we have everyone. Yeah. Dorothy. Dorothea. Oh, Dorothy is going to come, but she's going to come towards the end, right, Fred? Is she timing her entry tonight? I don't know if she's timing it, but she will be here in time to do the final exercise. Okay. okay. Is uh, my part. And, <clears throat> excuse me. So, Fred, this is your night, Maestro. The stage is yours. Take it away. Oh boy. Um, <laughs> good evening all. Um, sorry for the, the lighting, but I have yet to figure out how to zoom light appropriately. Um, so tonight we're going to be talking about consulting skills. We're going to leave kind of the technology and the finances a little bit behind and talk more about how do we become consultants. Um, I suppose I should at least uh, ground that I know something about this. I, I spent 30 years in management and leadership development, uh, working with a lot of high level people and individual contributors about how to consult with others to actually have a positive effect, um, to build trust, to become a trusted advisor. And I do not claim to know all the answers, but what we do have um, is I, I spent uh, three years working with a, a fellow in, in Berkeley, um, looking at how does, well, that's even worse, how does consulting actually work? And some of the tools that came out of this, and I'm kind of tool focused, I'm not interested in a whole lot of philosophy, I'm more interested in what can I use today to make my consulting better. Um, so that's where we're going tonight. We're going to start with just, there, there's a lot more to it than this, and we may offer all kinds of individual modules that you can just simply go and read. We might offer another session. But I wanted to start tonight really focusing on the main tools that can help us become better consultants. So that's where we're going. Um, David, do I have share capability or do you want to share? Um, I think I need to make you a co-host. Just try sharing. I'm not sure you can, Fred. Well, first, um, while we're doing that, I will make sure that my Presentation is up somewhere. Uh, I should be able to eventually, but um, let's start with. So Dorothea is on her way. She's here. There she is. Yes, she is. Okay, so Fred, I can make you a co-host, okay? So I'm making you a co-host now. <laughs> that would be perfect because then I can share. Yeah. You got it? Um, host disabled sharing. Let me try again. Host no, people I'm share. still disabled for sharing. If you go down to your security oh. as a host, if you go down to security, you can enable screen sharing for others. Does that make sense to you? Uh, I can't sit in security, but under your name in uh, participants, I says I can make you a co-host. So that'd be great. Uh, here we go. I think this is happening now. I am co-host now. I just, right, saw you, you just saw you do that. Cool. Okay. Does everybody see a screen that says consultative communication agenda? Or yes. Yeah. Okay. Cool. So this is what we're going to cover tonight. Um, the the biggest thing, well, the biggest thing, a major thing that I found. With, in working with clients is this distinction between needs and concerns. What do you say you need? What are the concerns that drive that need? So we're gonna start there. What's the distinction between the two and do we even care? And then we'll look at what additional tools could we use to continue to understand the needs and concerns? And then a particular method, diagnose, explore, visualize. I'm gonna run through these really quickly because I suspect most of you have a, a grounding in some sort of um, consulting or you wouldn't have asked to be here. Uh, the other part is how do we work with stakeholders? And, and we're gonna work on that as well. So I'm gonna just drive us into it because we have a relatively short period of time. So what's the distinction between needs and concerns? So my question to you is what the heck is a need? When someone says I need whatever, a computer, a car, solar panels, what are they saying? Well, it's the difference between a want and a need. They, they think it's an essential, a, a 
a want would be something that wouldn't be essential. Okay, great. That's that's a good way of looking at it, Scott. Anybody else? Well, let's go with that because we've got limited time. A need is what the client has already concluded will address an issue or an opportunity they're facing. I need solar panels. I need a new car. I need a computer, right? They've concluded that that's what they need. Okay, and that's fine. Often they're absolutely right. They need a new computer. They need a new car. They need solar panels, right? But behind that, what do you think concerns are? So I've stated, I need a new car. What are concerns? Worries about. Yeah. So, such as what, Katie? Just give me, I, I need a new car. Give me a concern. Um, how much can I afford to spend on a new car? You got it. What other concerns might I have about needing a new car? How much fun is it to drive the new car? How much fun is it to drive a new car? What else? Is it going to meet the need? But, but, but how do you mean that, Scott? I, you're right, but how do you mean that? Well, I need a car to get from point A to point B. Is it going to get me there? Okay, so it better be reliable. Reliability is a concern. What other sure. concerns might I have? Has to, does it, do you need it for your whole family or just for you? Does it? Uh, so if I'm an 18 year old looking for a new car, or I'm a 35 year old with two kids and I run soccer practice, what I need is a new car, but my concerns are very different. As an 18 year old, what my concerns be, might be. And how, it, how it looks, whether or not it's a chick magnet. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Is it a chick magazine? Is it cool? Does it fit my, you know, what I'm gonna, you know, wanna wanna put out there? What about for the 35 year old? Chick magnet? Maybe. Well, okay. <laughs> We're not gonna go there. <laughs> safe. But you're right, Katie. Maybe. Safe, the reliable. Reliable. Roomy enough to Roomy plug enough everything for around. the soccer team. Yep. Yeah. What is its what is its carbon footprint? What is its carbon footprint might be a very interesting issue that I'm I'm dealing with personally. So concerns are all the things, and there's never just one, that are driving the client to address that need. I need a new car. Why? Right. So what are the issues and challenges that a client considers relevant to the decision making? And I'm I'm going to point out that they're almost never just cost or businessy type things. They're very mm -hmm. often personal things as well. They're emotional. Emotional, yeah. Emotion gets in there. I want a chick magnet or I want to be able to drive 12 kids to a soccer game. Whatever, whatever, or six, you can't fit 12 in a minivan. You know, whatever it is. So the interesting thing about this is this is a really important distinction that we often miss. We hear the need. Are we really drilling for concerns or do we just hear the concerns we hear? And I'm gonna argue that consulting first and foremost is about addressing needs. Uh, sorry, I said that backwards. Addressing concerns, not about addressing the need. Of course you have to address the need, I need a new car. But if you don't address my concerns in a, how to get a new car or what that new car is gonna do for me or whatever my concerns are, then you miss the boat as a consultant to me. That's, it's so simple to say, it's so quick to say, it underlines all consulting relationships. It really does, in, in my experience anyway. It, it underlines all those desires and needs and concerns that I have. And if I can't make the distinction between the two, can I really be a consultant to you? Good question. But that's the base question, which everything we work on from all the rest of tonight lives with. Can I identify your concern and can I identify your need? And if I have two clients in the room and they both say we need solar panels, do they have the same concerns about that? I don't know. But in order to address their need for solar panels, I pretty much better know how client A and client B Think about that. What are the concerns driving that? And we'll go into that deeper later. So there's some simple kind of tools. I'm, I'm going to kind of bust through this early stuff quickly. 
um, and stop me if I'm going too fast, but I want to get to kind of the exercises and, and trying this stuff out. So there are some additional tools for understanding that can help me understand what are the concerns underlying the need. <clears throat> Excuse me. The first is to balance advocacy and inquiry when I'm working with a client. What's advocacy? Advocacy? Yeah. Argu arguing for. Yeah, I'm arguing for something, right? Right. I'm saying, this is what I think we should do, right? And I'm gonna do that by telling you, this is what I think, here's why I think it, and here's why you wanna do it, because you've got these benefits coming out of my approach, and I want you to understand those and then do what I say, <laughs> or, you know, whatever. Okay, what's inquiry? Are the, is that an expression of the concerns by the client? Interesting. Okay, what do you mean by that? Stuff? Well, I'll say that you explain your advocacy, but they have doubts about it or they're uncomfortable with certain aspects of it and that need to be addressed. Yeah, yeah. So inquiry is for me to go and ask, I'm going to say open-ended questions. We'll talk about that in a moment. But the whole point is to demonstrate that I really want to understand what you think. Right? I know my position. I advocated for it. But what's yours? Right? And that's a very simple thing. And, and you know, you think, this, what is, how is this a tool? It's a tool because if we think about it and we're conscious of what we're doing, then it makes a difference. So for instance, if I advocate my position and don't inquire into yours, what's the result? What's the potential possible result? You'll reject what I'm advocating for. I'm right. sorry? Rejection. Yeah, you might just reject it outright and then I've got nothing left. What else might someone hearing me advocate without inquiring think about me as a consultant? You might get a kind of, kind of piss off reaction i mean they may not say it to you but in their head they might be saying jesus christ get this guy out of here yeah what is he doing just telling me what i should do right. without it's... even understanding what i think right right so it can be seen as arrogant or uh unresponsive or a whole bunch of things so if i totally advocate i'm getting myself into a position that's problematic as a consultant so then maybe I should just totally inquire. Why, why would total inquiry not be something I should be doing? Then they won't think- I my advocacy. I got an idea, but I'm not even gonna talk about it. Yeah, they, you don't have any, um, you're not demonstrating your knowledge in that case. Yeah, exactly. You're not demonstrating your knowledge. You're not, um, you're not adding any value to the conversation, right? I'm just simply, listening to all you have to say, and then I go away. What did you get out of that conversation as a client? Not much. Frustration. Frustration would be one, yeah, absolutely. So balancing advocacy and inquiry is actually a tool. It's something that we can intentionally use to make sure that our voice is heard and our expertise is um, provided but if we're not inquiring to the other side, then we're just an arrogant person who shows up and tells you what you ought to do. Not a good idea. Does that make sense to everybody? Yes. I have a question. Please. Are we approaching the client with the need being reduced carbon footprint? Okay. Very vague need, right? How would, right. How would you begin to understand what they mean by I want to reduce my carbon footprint. No, that's what we're talking about. Approach it talking about, will yeah. allow you to reduce your carbon footprint. Yeah, what would allow you to reduce your carbon footprint? How do you? How are you thinking about that? Um, when you say reduce your carbon footprint, what are you concerned about? Are you concerned about cost while reducing it? Are you just concerned about reducing your carbon footprint? What have you thought about how you might do that, et cetera, et cetera. That's the inquiry side, right? Uh, and at some point, I'm going to say, well, I've heard you out, but you know, you haven't insulated the basement ceiling. 
and you're talking about putting solar panels on your roof. It, let's talk about that. Which would be the better solution? I'm not saying one way or the other, but I'm just saying you can, once you inquire, then as a consultant, when you advocate an idea, and you're not just saying we should do this, it's advocating, what do you think about this? This is the idea I think. Then you've, you're, you're making an impact by balancing the two. And that's how come I call it a tool? Because advocacy and inquiry balance becomes a tool for better consulting. Okay, let's jump to another one. <coughs> These are not gonna totally surprise you or change your life, but they are important. So moving from what we call affective language to report language. So when my wife says to me, and she does often, this is, it's cold in this room. That's effective language, affective language. She's saying, I am cold. This room is cold. What we can both agree on is that it's 70 degrees in the room. We can go to the thermostat and look at that and say, yeah, that's 70 degrees. Then we can have a discussion about, well, you say it's really cold, but you know what? I'm, I'm wearing a flannel shirt. Maybe you should just wear a flannel shirt and we could save some money. You know, I don't know what the answer is there, but once we go to report language, 70 degrees in this room, then we can decide, okay, you say it's cold, I say it's warm enough, let's negotiate. Okay. I'm gonna take you to a, a, a different one and, and this comes from a uh, information technology background just because that's where I come from. But I did hear someone once say, look, Bill is totally unprofessional. And you know what? IT should fire the guy, he shouldn't be here. Right? And I heard someone say that and I said, wow, uh, okay, what is that? Bill's an unprofessional, IT should fire him. You told me that. What is that for you? It's unsubstantiated. It's unsubstantiated, otherwise known as opinion, judgment, opinion. Burden, right? Mm -hmm. Now there may be things underneath it that substantiate it for you, but just simply saying to me, Bill's unprofessional, IT should fire him. What do I do with that? Nothing. I can't do anything with it. But if you said to me, look, Bill's unprofessional, IT should fire him. He spent two hours yesterday on personal phone calls. I said two cubicles away from him. I couldn't hear exactly what he was saying, but I know he was talking to his wife for two hours. I mean, come on, during work hours? And not only that, I came into the office twice, several times, more than twice over the last month. And he's unshaven and he's looking scraggly. He's got the, the beard thing happening. Of course, these days that's okay. But, um, <laughs> but you know, we'll, we'll go back a few years. So now you've grounded it for me. You told me he's not only unprofessional, but this is why I think so. Two hours of personal conversation, not shaving before coming to work. That's just not okay. It's not okay. Now, We've moved from affective language, he's unprofessional, to the facts behind what you said. Changed my perception. Because I actually now, what you told me, I believe Bill is unprofessional. Now, someone else comes into the conversation, change my perspective. Go ahead, try. I know he's unprofessional, you told me. Oh, well, you could say something like, yeah, but he works at home for the all evening long with work, you know, it's, it's like he works so many hours that those two hours of personal phone calls doesn't even make a dent in it. Doesn't make a dent. Maybe actually, because there's an IT information technology thing, he's actually been at work overnight, didn't go home, right? To right. get this new system up and running. He's doing 14, 16 hour days and sleeping at his desk. Oh, well now, does that change my perspective about Bill being unprofessional? Yeah. Well, oh, on top it. on top of that, the beard is the Don Johnson look, which is all yeah, around. I know. <laughs> I know. I probably should come up with a different example. <laughs> but yeah, the Don Johnson look. But he, wasn't work, he, wasn't, he wasn't working on Don Johnson. David, sorry. But, but, but maybe the clients love him. Clients do love him. Because why? Because he spends 14 hours a day working he, to get really, their system up and running. He right? really gets their problem solved. So right. clients love him. So why do I care if it's got a beard? Yeah. Well, I, I might, it might be in our particular, you know, uh, company. We, we have a quote professional look or whatever. Um, also, 
maybe he spent two hours with his wife talking on the phone because their kids in the hospital. Right? They have, they have a family crisis. They have a family crisis. So he's but, at but work. He's, but he's on the job. Yeah, he's at work during a family crisis. So what I'm pointing at here is even when you get to report language, that doesn't solve it, but it helps you solve it because now I can say, well, why was he on the phone? Why was he unshaven? And the solution is either send him home to work with his family because the guy's having trouble, or at least get him a what 19 cent thick razor and <laughs> one of the little things of travel um, shaving cream so that before other people come into the office in the morning, you can look professional. But this is the, the kind of power of moving from affective to report language. In the affective language, it's cold in this room, feels unprofessional. I, I really can't do anything about it. Give me the report. And now maybe I can say, well, wait a minute, there's a fact you didn't know. Did you know Bill's family was really in crisis? Did you know he's been sitting here 14 hours a night trying to fix this system to get it up when we told the client it would be up? Very different. Now, you know, I can make up any examples I want. <laughs> um, so it's kind of unfair. But the truth is that moving from affective to report language can help you understand better what's going on. That's, that's the point. And there's one that's similar, but a little bit different is moving from the abstract to the concrete. So if I said to you, our client's unhappy, you could say, oh, Jane's unhappy? Oh, I'll have to call her. Well, maybe it's not Jane, maybe it's Rob. And I just didn't say Rob, I just said the client. You made the assumption it was Jane, you call Jane, say, what's the problem? She said, there's no problem, what's going on? Da, 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 da. And you create a fuffle that isn't needed, right? But if I tell you at least Rob's unhappy, now you know who to work with. But it's better if I go down to the concrete and just simply say, look, Rob's disappointed and he's worried that we're coming in over 6% over budget. Now I can work with that. Maybe I need to apologize or maybe I need to say, well, you realize your group said it was gonna be 15 and we've brought it down to six, that's an improvement. I don't know what the particular situation would be, but without that report language, I can't deal with the situation. Okay, and the last one of these is a really simple one, which is simply use writing. Um, it might be post-its, meeting notes, working notes, existing documents. I can give you an example, um, which probably you won't run into, but you might. I was working with um, Hewlett Packard and they had a production issue in one of their newer printers, which was just stopping everything. They were way behind. They had no idea how to address it. Um, and we started saying, well, okay, who's asking for stuff? Who's giving that stuff? What's the time frames? And we just wrote everything on post-it notes and put it on literally a 30 foot long wall because it's pretty complex business problem. And what we found out using post-its was at one point, all the post-its came together with one person. So all these streams of work were coming to David. And if David didn't react fast enough, the stream slowed down or simply stopped. Right? So we looked and said, well, how would we rearrange these post-it notes so that it doesn't all flow, flow through, through David? And that made a huge difference. That's a little bit of an outlier, but there may be complex times when it's useful to just put a bunch of post-it notes up and say, well, wait a minute, what if we did this here? What if that happened here, right? The more powerful ones for us as consultants in, in our world of coaching for, for uh, energy are, are making sure that meeting notes are clear or working notes, either way. And one of the things I really like to do in meeting and working notes is at the end, put together an action item list. So in the notes, we'll say, David's going to do this, and Katie's going to do this, and you know, whoever is going to do whatever. But um, what it allows us to do is actually track and say, OK, Katie, did you actually do that when you said you would? Report back to us. You know, um, And it helps keep things together. And then, of course, <clears throat> there are all the existing documents that we as coaches have at our disposal, whatever reports we have from outside agencies, the energy audit that people did, that gives us data, the client questionnaire, that gives us data. As we're moving forward, what are the contractor proposals? What about the contract itself, et cetera? So um, 
grounding things with writing can be really helpful. Not always necessary, but uh, not looking when it's necessary can cause problems because a week from now when we meet again with a client, they're not, they don't remember X. They've had a million things happening in their lives since then. Um, so just another possibility. So those are four potential tools for meeting, uh, for understanding both needs and concerns. Balance your advocacy with inquiry and don't do just one or the other. Move from the affective language, is cold in this room, to report language. And then get down from the abstract to the concrete. Client's unhappy, no, Rob's unhappy about this. And then use writing to, to kind of keep that together. Now that's the end of, of running quickly through tools for understanding. Any questions, concerns, thoughts? Uh, you're totally off your head, Fred, whatever. <laughs> One observation, Fred, I know I have found writing things down during meetings, I'm not just talking, I'm talking about my, my career and not just with energy coaching, but, but particularly, with, particularly with energy coaching, is it really helps in one key way, which is it tells the client you are listening. Yes. When you write something down, and perhaps you can check and say, did I get that correctly? Is, 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 that what you, is that what you're talking about? That tells the client you're listening. That is such a huge like, signal of connectedness. I found that very useful, even if you don't need the notes. Take notes. Right. <laughs> I often don't need notes because I know what was said, but sending them out allows people to say, oh, wait a minute, Fred. No, I, I didn't commit to that. Or, no, you, you didn't understand. I was saying this. Right? So it's a great way of stopping misconception before it gets too deep. And I can tell you in, in my work with um, the Energy Committee and uh, with Upper Charles Climate Action, when we've had campaigns, there are often big misconceptions out there. We've, we've stated very clearly what we thought was clear and someone walks away saying something very different because they heard it differently. Right? So if I don't have meeting notes and ways of saying, did I hear you correctly? I'm not gonna know if I didn't. Right? And, and also, frankly, it allows someone to say, I didn't commit to that. <laughs> you know? um, so these are, these are just a few simple tools for understanding and there, there are much deeper ones and we can go into them in another session, but these are ones that you can do without a whole lot of preparation. Okay, so, if we understand that needs and concerns are a distinction and we need to pay attention to both, but very strongly to concerns underlying things, and we have these additional tools for understanding, how do we kind of methodize it? And there are so many methods for having conversations. I'm gonna give you one, you can take it, you can leave it, you can do as you like. <clears throat> but I found that diagnosing before I prescribe anything is really important. And then once we've diagnosed it, to kind of explore it a little further before we come to any kind of solution and then to visualize solutions. So diagnosing before you prescribe simply means asking a lot of open-ended questions. I, I'm assuming you're all somewhat uh, aware of the active listening process and we can support that later. I'm not gonna go into it in any depth, uh, any real depth tonight. But active listening is the act of listening empathetically, not sympathetically. And what I mean by that is, is simple dictionary definition. Sympathy is the situation in which what affects one correspondingly affects the other. I feel your pain, or I don't, right? You got pain, I don't got it. That's still sympathetic listening. I'm listening to how I want to think and respond to what you're saying. Empathetic listening, according to the American um, Heritage Dictionary, <clears throat> is a situation in which the thoughts, feelings, and emotions of one person are readily comprehended by the other. Not agreed with, disagreed with, judged, evaluated, just simply comprehended. So in active listening, I'm trying to comprehend what's the nature of the thing you're trying to deal with? Why do you care? What are the root causes that you see important to this particular solution that you think your need, that you think will solve the issue? What's the size of this issue? What are the da 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 
I'm actively listening without judging or preconceiving. I'm simply listening to comprehend you. So if you want to take that to the extreme, I should be able to sit down with Idi Amin, you know, Hitler, you name the worst <laughs> one. You, you, you name the worst one you can think of. I should be able, if I'm listening actively, I should be able to listen totally to what Idi Amin was saying and comprehend why he was saying it. After which I will send him to jail because I, you know, but, <laughs> but the first action is to fully comprehend what that person's saying. <clears throat> now, it doesn't mean that I'm going to disagree with them. I could totally agree with them. But even if I totally agree with them, I stop myself from saying so until I've heard their perspective. So what's their perspective of the need? What are the opportunities that are lost or gained by addressing or not addressing the specific stated need. So you say you want heat pumps. Well, what opportunities are lost and what are gained by heat pumps in your particular house, right? So now that I've kind of diagnosed with you for a while, this is a speculative conversation. So it can't go on for a long, long time. I don't know about you, but I've been in more meetings where speculation goes on and on and on. And are we ever going to get to a decision? Are we ever going to act? But you can't shortchange it either. So I don't have a rule, but there's some time in, during which this open-ended diagnostic thing should be happening. Now, once I've diagnosed, of course, I can tell them what they should do. Not yet. Right? I want to explore, <clears throat> OK, we've talked about your needs, your concerns. Multiple stakeholders are in the room. Uh, the wife, the, the grandmother, the homeowner, the whatever, right? Assuming the homeowner isn't a female, which is not right. Um, so who else in this client's home or family is affected by what we're trying to do here, right? And it might actually not just be home or family. Maybe it's a neighbor. Maybe I'm thinking about putting up a ground-mounted display, uh, uh, array, sorry, not a display, an array. Um, Same thing. Yeah, pretty much for people who don't like them. Um, so what effect is this going to have on my financial goals, the personal goals that I've, I've expressed, the financial goals and personal goals of other main stakeholders, um, and which would include maybe potential family members, um, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I can't predict who all the stakeholders are going to be in any one of your projects. I can predict that anybody living in the house probably is a stakeholder. And I can predict actually that once we get to contractors, they're stakeholders too. Their concerns and their needs are different. They want money and they want the project and they want to fit it into their schedule, but they're still stakeholders. Right? So who else does this have an effect on? And now finally, after all that, we get to visualize solutions. But if we haven't diagnosed, if we haven't explored first, we're going to miss stuff, important stuff sometimes. So what might solve the problem or forward the opportunity? Because it's not always about problems that our clients are talking. I have an opportunity to lower my carbon footprint. That's an opportunity, not a problem. Right? So as a coach or as a consultant, I'm going to best serve by asking questions at first, not giving advice or the answer that I think from reading the client questionnaire and the energy um, assessment from MassSave and stuff. I may have a very strong idea of what you need to do, but it's not the time to put that out yet, right? I'm gonna ask questions and obviously if I have a idea of where we might go, my questions will point in that direction, but I'm not advocating outright at this point. So I'm gonna propose ideas, but it always is best if the client hears my ideas and rolls with them and eventually the client feels like, oh, I came up with this solution. Katie helped me, but I came up with the solution, right? It's my solution. That's going to be a lot better than me telling you what to do and Cindy turning around and saying, I don't want to do that because I haven't really heard her concerns yet. So that's that. Okay. Does all this make sense? Because we're now going to leap into a bunch of exercises where you're all doing it. Any questions, concerns, thoughts, rags, bones, bottles of spare? By the way, for 200 points, where does that quote come from? Rags, bones, bottles to spare? 
Anybody? Sounds like Charles Dickens. Actually, Marx Brothers, Night at the Opera. <laughs> Don't worry about it. It's obscure. Okay. <laughs> And so the younger are, generation would say, who's the Marx Brothers? Yeah, there is, there is that, but God, I knew you'd know. Um, so putting it all together, now we're going to try and, and meet with a client, understand their needs and concerns, see what tools for understanding we can use, see if we can use a diagnosis, explore, visualize method. This is your, you know, this is the first shot at it. So we're not looking for anything even close to perfection, just an attempt, right? So you can see how this feels, how it works. Right? So what's going to happen here is you're about to meet with a homeowner for the first time. Now, David vetted them and decided you were the right coach, but he really didn't get into all the particulars because that's your job. Right? So it's your understanding that this client is considering solar a solar array, but you honestly don't have a lot more info than that. And um, if you would take out the document that um, David sent you earlier today called resource, uh, requirements. Where is my requirements doc? At any rate, it's a requirements doc. There we go. Okay. Case requirements doc, consultative skills workshop. Uh, I told you either to print it out or if you're happy moving back and forth between your screen and this, that's fine too. Don't read it yet because each of you is going to read a different section of it. So if you come into this, as the people you are, right? So what do we need? <clears throat> well, first we're gonna need a homeowner and the homeowner is simply gonna read only the second page, client's background information. So David, what's the easiest way to split people up into two, um, two breakout rooms? We need three of us coaches in each place. So you want two breakout rooms, is that right? Want two breakout rooms. Let's put uh, Katie, Scott, and Cindy together. Hang on. I don't know why, but they're just on my screen. <laughs> okay, Cindy, Katie, and Scott, you're in room one. Okay, don't go there yet. <laughs> and then room two, uh, Colleen, Karen. Karen and Nicole, is that it? That's it. That should cover us all. Okay, and then I've got Dorothea, Fred, and Mia not allocated at this point. That's right. We're going to uh, fly on the wall in the room. Okay. So just to say when, and I'll open the rooms up. Okay, we will do. So for uh, Katie, Scott, and Cindy, who's going to play the homeowner? Okay, Scott is the homeowner. He raised his hand first. Sorry. Oh, you did the little hand symbol, though. That's pretty cool. <laughs> but Scott one, all the same. Okay, so Scott's going to be the homeowner. He's only going to read page two, the homeowner client notes. Who's going to be the coach? I'll be the coach. Okay, Katie's going to be the coach. You only read the coach's notes. Don't read the other two pages. And Cindy, I think you were the third one. Okay, good. Your job is a really important one. You're going to be the observer. So you don't say anything, you don't speak anything, you just watch and take notes. So you're going to take notes and you're going to read the observer's notes, which is page three. And then you get the extra fun of reading either the coach or client notes so that you know what's going on. Fair enough? Okay, in the other room, and I'm not seeing everybody on my screen at the moment, but um, it's Karen, Nicole, and Colleen, right? So who's the homeowner? I'll, I'll do it. Okay, Nicole is the homeowner. We're going fast. Any, anybody who, who volunteers is automatically it. How about the coach? Karen, Colleen, which one? I'll take either one. What do you want, Colleen? I'll take observer. <laughs> okay, so Karen, you're the coach. Colleen, yep. you're the observer. So we're going to take a few minutes before we go to the room to read the parts of the document that you need to read. And please don't read others because you're, because you're not the client if you're the coach. So you don't know what the client is thinking. Okay, so let's give you a couple of minutes, maybe two, maybe three. Um, and just uh, in Zoom, raise your hand when you feel like you've 
read the notes. You're not memorizing them. These are just background information. And David, I'm only able to see half the people at a time, so you can keep an eye on when people are putting their hands up. Uh, you should be able to just scroll up and down. If you change I, it to the top right hand corner. Yeah, I do. Um, okay, I'll work it out. Don't worry about it. Um, everyone's reading away. If you unscreen share, you might. Yeah, I'm not worried about it. I can flip back and forth. Like that. I'm done. Oh, I never lowered it. Okay, Katie, you're good to go. Good to go. I'm not in the room, though. Nope, nope, we're not going to move anybody into rooms so till everybody's read and had a chance to. Ah, okay, got you. Ingest. You good, Scott? I'm good. Okay, good. Oh, you look like you might be done. Ready. Okay, good. Colleen, how about you? You look, you're looking up. Good. I'm good. This is not a speed reading class, by the way. If you need more time, that's totally cool. <laughs> uh, are you ready to launch then, Fred? Almost. It looks like uh, Cindy. You good? Yeah, I'm set. Okay, and uh, Sharon, you good? Okay, then let's launch. And and David, you could throw um, Dorothea or me or you into any room just as a fly on the wall. So we're gonna break out into rooms. Uh, this is not a full conversation. Obviously, if we were meeting with a client for the first time, it would be a lot longer than a 10 minute conversation. So just go as far as you can with the diagnose, explore, visualize, understanding concerns, et cetera, et cetera. And we'll see how it works. Uh, we have a more in-depth conversation coming up anyway. So breakout rooms, David? Okay, I can do it, Fred. Now, I, I've got uh, the, the three people in each room. Those are what? How was it? Oh, no. Okay, I'll uh, welcome back. All right, Katie sold me two hundred thousand dollars worth of soul. <laughs> yeah, okay, the address. I'll give you the address. <laughs> so my allowance has been dedicated to those payments from now on. She was amazing. I mean, really, it just addressed all my concerns. So we're gonna um, we're gonna uh, debrief that exactly, and and I'd kind of like to start. And first of all, let's acknowledge 10 minutes is no conversation in terms of how we're really going to be coaching. But it did give us a sense of, of how to go about it. So how I'd like to debrief is start with the observers. What did you see? And how did the conversation go? Did the, uh, were the, did the, did the coach look for concerns? Did they, um, did they set a good tone? Uh, how did they help? Did they use any tools for understanding, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, I believe, Nicole, you were one of the observers. Why don't we start with you? How did your conversation go? Well, um, 
it's tricky because we're both like, trying to like, oh, well, I am at least trying to read the information back to let her know what, you know, what my situation was. Um, and I thought, oh, um, was the oh, sorry, were you the client? Did I get that wrong? Were you the client? Yeah, the client. Yeah, sorry. Okay, sorry. Uh, Colleen, you were yeah. the observer. Sorry, we're going to yeah. start with the observers. I didn't mean to, to okay. make a mistake there, Colleen. Uh, Nicole. So Colleen, what did you see? Cool. Yeah. I mean, so in ours, um, Karen was the coach, Nicole was the homeowner. Um, and I mean, they started it, Karen started it out with, you know, quick like introduction and kind of, oh, I know a little bit about your home. Um, tell me a little bit more. So nice, like open-ended questions to, to get some information. Um, I think, I think one thing I saw was kind of this wanting to match up like a lot of like, okay, here are some things to consider a lot of like fact-based, um, you know, how are your windows? You might want to consider windows. How is insulation? You might want to consider that, but not always. I think if there's one like piece of constructive criticism, it's like trying to hear the concerns more and like unite them better with the things that you're presenting. So like Nicole mentioned, that her basement had sm was smelling like moldy. Um, and she had mentioned that like, it's cold, but, and yet she's asking for solar panels. And it's kind of like those, those like take a step back, like, okay, are you concerned about the moldy basement? Do you, you know, do you want to fix like that? You know, solar panels aren't going to make it warmer in your house. <laughs> um, I don't know. I think some of that like big picture stuff um, so, so the ability to, or the approach of first hear what the concerns are about solar panels and then start to modify that concern to say, well, what about those 24 old single pane windows? What about, you know, so listen first and then redirect? Yeah. I mean, and I think Karen like addressed each individual piece, but I think it, I think it's a real challenge to take someone's like here's a bunch of facts about my house. And then you're trying to like meet them with all of those. Um, and the other, the other thing that came up was just like, oh, how old is your furnace? And, you know, Nicole saying like, oh, it's, it's 12 years old, but like, I don't want to replace it. Um, and I was, we were talking, we kind of like said at the end, I feel like that's going to come up a lot where homeowners are like, I'm not at all interested in replacing this giant piece of equipment. And it's like, how do you delicately deal with that? <laughs> right. And David has told us in, in previous things, you're not going to get rid of your furnace. You can have all the heat pumps in the world, but at 20 degrees yeah. and below, you're going to need some furnace backing. Yeah. And so, so there's a beautiful misconception that the client has. I got to get rid of my furnace to get heat pumps. No, actually, you got to keep it. That, that wasn't the concern. It was more like, I don't need a new furnace. My furnace is fine. Um, yeah. So I don't want to you know, my furnace is only 12 years old. I just, I don't feel like it needs to be replaced. That's such a big expense. So it's just. So why would I do something different? Yeah. It's like calling in for an energy coach and um, just interested because all you know about or heard about is solar panels. It's like, how do you, you know, take a person like that and, and present all the other options and, you know, how that might work out for them. Right. Maybe I wouldn't. I don't know. I mean, that's that's tough. That's a good question for David. Like, well, it might not work out. I mean, it, it could be that you understand that there are potentially better results, or, or you as a coach, sorry, could understand that there are better results than the client is looking for. That maybe solar panels are suboptimal to doing other things, but you're not making the final decision anyway as a as a coach. So, yes, David. Yeah, so just on, on that on that point, Nicole, I've I find if someone if someone says in very advocacy type language, I think I need solar panels, or I think there's a uh, my furnace is too old, or something like that. What I find is helpful is to accept what the client is saying, saying, you know, solar panels are probably going to be part of the solution here, but let's do the diagnosis before we do the prescription. Right. And I found using that kind of doctors and everyone gets, you walk into a doctor's office, they do not hand you a prescription. That's not how doctors work. You say, here's penicillin. I don't, I don't, care. I don't want to hear you've got a headache. Here's penicillin. Right. That's not what happens. But, but 
for many mm. times they have the most common things i hear is i've heard of geothermal is that right for me because yeah. uh, for some reason geothermal has a much bigger kind of image than than air source heat pumps i don't know if it's just marketing whatever it is but people have heard of geothermal and it's kind of interesting it's a little bit sexy and so they they often say yeah I, i've heard of geothermal that's really good but my friend's got one down the road friend down the road's got it um or solar panels well, everyone's heard of solar panels so they, they sort of know know that and i find you know, if i just accept what they're saying say yeah you know what solar panels could well be part of the solution here but let's get the diagnosis right before we get onto the prescriptions and yeah. I've, ne i've never found anyone say oh no i i want the prescription right away doctor <laughs> nobody's <laughs> ever said that i didn't give me, give me a minivan i'm 18 years old but give me a minivan <laughs> what the hell you know um, but but I also, so we're, nicole we're, and karen um just really quickly because we're running somewhat low on time and I want to definitely get to the last exercise. What were your experiences in the interchange? I thought it was good, but I, if it's, um, it's a bit, if, if I was a homeowner and just like, it's a like bit overwhelming to have all these different facts like brought into you like, oh, you should think about insulation, you should think about, I don't know. I think maybe it's because I was like, read ahead of time read david's book and i was like okay i know all these things i don't know to just hear it right off the bat makes it kind of a little bit more difficult but hey, even it, having I, read david's book having someone just pile ideas on you is and i'm not saying that's what you did karen but is it, even someone just piling ideas on you is overwhelming so how do we bring someone from where they are to where they might get a better solution and so it's a really interesting question Karen for you how was that um it was just like Nicole is saying but I was the coach <laughs> so I had to I had to read through the information and, and try to figure out um how these pieces of information fit with the suggestions that we're supposed to be making yeah so and, and honestly in a in an eight to ten minute conversation you can't do that so all we were doing was kind of looking at how do we approach this not how do we solve it mm -hmm. so, yeah so uh, I, given... I tried to ask questions and I tried to listen and I, I tried to um, um, I, I wasn't as eloquent as David was but I said you, you know there are other there are additional um, strategies to reducing um, your power usage and your loss of heat that will help when you install your solar panels to have them be more effective. So that was great. One. Good for you. Okay, really, uh, because we're running low on time and, and good job, Triad one or two, whoever you are. Um, Cindy, you are the observer for the other. What did you see? Um, so I, I think like it's already, it's already been stated, you know, it's just such a short period of time. So I, I feel like Scott was just trying to download all the information to Katie really fast, just run through all of the stats on his paper. And um, and then, you know, and then and then Katie kind of, you know, jumped in with it. She understands, she was empathetic. And um, um, I, I I feel like she probably Katie needed to ask more questions about um, about Scott's situation, like, you know, um, if there's spouse, kids, that didn't really come up. Um, so she didn't really know who the stakeholders were until Scott started interjecting that, you know, he had a wife. So, you know, at that point it came up, but that was further along. Um, uh, Katie did mention that there was other, you know, um, I think like Karen was saying, she did mention that there was other, you know, uh, conservation measures that could be taken, you know, to help with the home. Um, but didn't, again, there was no time. She couldn't really get into all of, you know, the details. So it's just like this broad brush sort of, you know, there's these other conservation um, applications. Um, and, and then she was also talking about mass save. <laughs> so, um, and what they could do for the client, you know, for the client. Okay. And, and Katie and, and Scott, quickly, what do you, what did you observe? Well, I was impressed by Katie's response. I mean, she was 
she put my mind at ease at some concerns. Uh, she made it known that uh, the carbon committee was a resource that I could rely on. I have a, a, uh, an appointment with Mass Safe coming up that I'm anxious about because they may provide uh, recommendations that I won't understand. Uh, and then if I do go forward with Mass Safe, how do I know they're doing what they're supposed to be doing? Right. And, she, and she addressed that very, I thought very well. I mean, I, I, I came out of that meeting with more confidence uh, about the situation than I did before. That's consulting. This is my area of expertise. I, am, I know nothing about, I, I came in here knowing only solar panels. And I wanted to say geothermal sounds like of the earth. Heat pump sounds like of the industrial park. But my first career, my big career was engaging people. And it seems to me that the very first thing you have to do is engage with the person. Because if you don't engage with the person, you're done. You got it. And so I use a lot of humor. I try to be uh, chummy, but also empathetic. But where I couldn't go, you know, was to say, okay, the, the solar number is 52. I didn't remember what that, I, I need to learn this. I don't know this yet. Yeah. And so, that's, you know, and that's was, the important thing to understand is that we're not, none of us on this call are at the point, I'm David, but nobody else, um, <laughs> where, where we can just come up with quick answers and, or, or, or replies. And sometimes it simply says, it takes saying, you know what, I'm going to have to find that out for you because I don't know it. Right. And that's, that is the best thing you can say because people trust you when you say that. I agree. Yes. And we're going to, one of the modules that I'm going to offer later and optionally uh, includes the whole idea of how actually do you build trust. And there's been a huge amount of research behind what trust is and, and how people build it, et cetera. So um, I'm going to go back to sharing my screen again. Um, because we need to move on. We're running low on time and time is of the essence. Um, we may actually kind of skip the next exercise and go to the final one, only because I'd like to spend as much time as possible on that. But I do want to talk about, you know, how is it, and you've all mentioned the word stakeholders, right? Because there are multiple, I'll tell you, there's almost never one stakeholder. Okay, if I'm working with someone who lives <coughs> alone in their house, in the woods with no neighbors nearby, and they're not planning to do anything that um, you know the building inspector is going to work on. Fine, then I have one stakeholder, but that's hardly ever the case. Okay? So uh, I'm going to expose you to a tool. We're actually not going to do the exercise on it because we're running low on time, but you'll be able to figure out how to do this yourself. The stakeholder chart helps you to identify who has a stake in this project. And that's an expansive thought. It's not just the homeowner and maybe their spouse, but what about neighbors? What about the contractors? They have some stake in the project when you decide to use a contractor. Is the um, planning board or the town inspector or whomever part of the stakeholders as well? Yes. Once, once I know who, yeah, they are generally. <laughs> once I knew who they are, then um, who are the high priority stakeholders? So maybe the neighbors aren't that high priority or maybe they are. Um, what have they concluded they need? So maybe you concluded you need solar panels, including a ground array, but your stakeholder has said, I, I sorry, your neighbor has said ground array, uh-uh. So they conclude they don't need that, they don't want that in the neighborhood. Uh, what concerns underlie their needs? What do you need from them? What's the best plan of action? So I, I did <coughs> distribute to you a stakeholder chart that we're actually going to try and fill out, but it's gonna to take too much time. But I wanna kind of review it because it's an important <coughs> tool for keeping yourself organized. So who has a vested interest in the outcome of the project? And what's their importance? So, you know, my homeowner one and, and homeowner two, maybe the grandparent lives there, maybe a kid lives there. Those are all primary stakeholders. The kid may be secondary because they don't get to spend the money and make the decisions, but what they care about matters. They live there. Okay. Then you got neighbors, contractors, da, 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 da. So there's almost never, almost never one stakeholder in any project. Um, 
So what did the stakeholders say they need? In other words, what did they conclude will solve their problem? Well, maybe one concluded solar panels, another concluded insulation. Maybe the kids concluded this and the grandparents concluded that. Too damn cold in this house, I'm 85 degrees and I'm 85 years old and 31 degrees doesn't do it for me, whatever. Right? What are the concerns? So we need solar panels, why? Why do you say that? And then, so, so this is the basic stuff. Who are the stakeholders? What do they say are the needs? What are the concerns underlying those needs? And then we can go further and say, okay, well, what do I need from him or her? So in Scott's situation, or actually uh, in Nicole's, I think as well, they haven't had a mass save audit yet, right? What do I need from them? I need them to complete a mass save audit. I need Scott and Nicole to go back and work with them to fill out their questionnaire better so that, that David can run their numbers and we can work with actual data rather than opinion. And then lastly, what's the action plan? Where do we go from here? And that's gonna evolve over time, but we just continually fill in, okay, action now is this, completed, action now is this, completed, action now is this, completed. I'm not saying you have to build a stakeholder chart. I'm thinking it's really smart to at least think about these things if you don't actually write them down. Does that make sense, everybody? David. Just want to give you guys an example. This is very real. I have a client who lives in a small house on a, on a small wooded lot. And most of the shit on her roof is caused by her neighbor's trees. And initially, she believed that she could negotiate with the neighbors to have some branches trimmed or, or even a tree removed. And the neighbors said no. So in the end, we had to redo her plan because she couldn't generate as much solar power as she thought she could. In the end, we came up with a very creative solution, which is putting a solar panels over, they became a canopy essentially, like a sunshade over her deck. And that gave us an extra, I don't know, 10 panels. And that was enough. So she could actually generate enough solar panel electricity. But like the stakeholders really matter. If, 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 if and the plan changed significantly based off what the stakeholders said. The stakeholder was a neighbor, not somebody living in a house. Yeah. So that's a, that's a much better example than I thought of because it's very real. Yeah. Um, I've got ancient oaks all around my house. If my neighbor wanted me to cut them down so that they could get better solar exposure, I would be arguing about carbon sinks and everything else. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we're going to skip this exercise. And we're going to jump right to the last one because I want to be able to spend, we've got like 15 minutes left. I want to be able to spend, again, at least 10 minutes, maybe more talking through this. So this is a different client. We have not met with this client before. Totally different situation. Okay. However, the client did meet with you a week ago, one-on-one, -on -one, and this is what they told you. They established that they want to install solar panels, but not just solar panels, enough added solar coverage in case they want to add heat pumps later, and they're really and the client was really thinking, we're going to get a, a an electric vehicle in a couple of years. Let's just build the thing so it's ready to go, so that when we buy that EV, we don't have to go out and get someone to put in an inverter and change our panels and not, you know change our our electrical panel and do all this stuff. It's there. It's waiting for our EV, right? It's also convinced that that capital outlay in extending the solar array beyond what's needed currently, even if it means adding ground mounted. So we've got a 3,000 square foot house footprint. Um, and he feels like, let's just put it all in and, you know, net metering will absorb the extra output until I need it with my EV or with my heat pumps. The sun rating is, is 68.9 and, and Katie, that just means they've got a fairly good solar coverage on the roof. Um, I believe, and David, you can help me out here, that 100% would mean that you never are out of, during daylight hours, it's always on your roof. Yeah, 100% means full sun. Yeah. So this is, you know, three quarters sun. Now, after the first meeting uh, discussion, solar panels and possibly heat pumps, seem to you and to the client to be a viable solution. Insulation, windows, leak proofing, all that's been done. So the house is in good shape and solar panels do appear to be a good answer. So for the second meeting, 
the stakeholder spouse is going to be joining you. And this is the first time you'll be meeting with him or her, whoever it is. Right? Um, so we're going to jump into this meeting and David and uh, Sorry, I want to make sure I get this right. Yes, David and Dorothea are going to be the homeowner and the spouse. Right? And you can decide which is which. Um, who is willing to be the coach for this one? Just need a volunteer. Okay, I'll do it. <laughs> oh, good. Who, who just spoke up because I was watching Scott laugh. No, it's Katie. Katie, okay, great. So Katie, you're meeting with these people. The rest of us are going to just watch, right? Because we're going to stay in the main room. And this is the, the fact of the matter. So Dorothea, David, you ready to go? Yeah, I'm ready. But now I've already met with David. I'm just meeting Dorothea for the first time. You're just meeting Dorothea for the first time. It's real clear what David thinks. There it is right up on screen. Hey, Katie, okay. good to see you again. Hi, how are you, David? How are you feeling about our talk from last week? I, 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 I think you're onto something, Katie. I think, you know, we've got a sunny roof and and I really like that you're having solar panels. So I think it's, yeah, I think, it's, I think, I think what you said was great. And anyway, why don't you uh, meet my wife, Dorothy? Um, she and I have talked about this and I think we're kind of on the same page, right, Dorothy? Uh, yes, um, I do have my concerns, though, that I would like to bring up today, honey. Okay, go ahead. Go, go, go. <laughs> yeah, I'm just meeting you. I'm delighted to meet you. And of course, we want to hear from you. This is your house. It's our house. And, um, you know, I think uh, um, David, my husband, he usually has this great vision and um, I'm thinking this time, I mean, I do like these solar panels um, and I think that's a great solution, but uh, I think we're we're getting a little bit too many of them. I'm just have concerns that, you know, we're overbuilding here and extending too much. Um, I'm not, you know, at this point, don't see us doing all of the things that he envisions like the, the extra car and the air source heat pump and, uh, I just feel like um, we're we should start slowly. What are your concerns, Dorothy? Are you worried about the cost? Well, the cost is there too, but then the aesthetics. I mean, um, I think uh, you know. Um, in your first consult in consulting session, you were uh, talking about. Um, how many panels are we going to get? I think uh, you guys envisioned also some some ground mount uh, panels. Is that right? I don't know. <laughs> did we? Okay, let's do it again. Let's David, you discussed that. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. I thought it was a great idea because right now, what, 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 what I think you were saying last time, Katie, is that with the roof on the house, we could probably power the house. As it is today, but but if we want to do heat pumps, which which um, I mean, Dorothy and I haven't really discussed, but I think it's a good idea. So maybe we can discuss that a bit later, Katie. But if we do heat pumps, I know that's going to take more electricity. And if we do replace, you know, my car is getting old, and we're going to have to replace it in the next few years. If we replace that with an electric vehicle, I really fancy those testers, by the way. Then um, I don't think we'll have enough. So that's why I was thinking about it, um, dearest. Was that I think I think we might need more more solar panels otherwise we're just going to have more carbon footprint in the future that's what that's what i was that's what i, that's what I thought you were going katie well i mean we we did discuss the fact that if you plan to put in a heat pump and buy an electric vehicle your solar costs will go up quite a bit from that and that can be offset by solar panels but if you haven't discussed the heat pump with dorothea i think um we need to talk to dorothea about what that is and and help her understand your thinking as far and our thinking as far as why you would consider it okay let's, let's go i think it'd be a great conversation mm -hmm. what other questions do you have dorothea 
Well, you know, there are two things in regards of like uh, cost is a concern for me. And I guess if we uh, uh, pour the money into the ERSO seed pump, there will be other investments uh, and other things that are concerning me. Uh, we will be short of money. That's a very, very real concern. Yeah. And something that I think for, for me need to look at. Um, mm -hmm. Please I was going to say, because over time, you ask money. In terms of cash flow on short term, that's something you two will have to look at. And I can help you with what the financial um, investment and return on investment will be. But the, there's never an immediate return on investment. You also can take advantage of no interest loans, which are offered by the state. Mm -hmm. the state. Yeah. And that, but that sounds for, great Katie. for many can people. You, can you tell us more? Because if I, I'm gonna, I, I agree with Dorothea, like this is, we don't have infinite money in this house. So we're gonna have to make some choices here. It's not, we can't do everything. And we absolutely can't do everything at once. But maybe, maybe you could help us like, I don't know, sort through it all. Well, I think it helps a lot to figure your priorities and put them in order. And also, um, make sure that you're conserving as much as you can going into it, uh, which involves looking at your windows and your installation. Um, the state offers a $25,000, up to $25,000 interest-free over seven years with inflation. You're actually making money, although not much right now, but uh, that, that is very helpful and has been used by many of our clients and uh, has made investment in this type of um, uh, energy reduction uh, much more within reach for many people who might not otherwise be able to look at it. Did you say zero interest, Katie? I like, believe so. Zero? Am I right? Isn't it zero interest? Yeah, yeah you are right, you are right, yeah. yeah. So, uh, I mean, Dorothy, that sounds, that's like free money. I mean, that sounds like that sounds that makes me more interested, Katie. No one, no one that I yeah, but you that. can't take it up to Encore and gamble with it. <laughs> <laughs> Damn. Okay. Damn. <laughs> right. Given our given our time, this conversation is going really great. I wish we could continue it for another 45 minutes because I think we get to some really cool stuff. However, we are running up right against time. So how'd that go? Um just anybody, we're all observers here. What did you see, what worked, what didn't work? Um, what were the missed opportunities, what the, the gained opportunities, whatever you observed? I think I mean, you made Dorothea feel heard. And I think it's very mm -hmm. tricky to, to work with a couple, but I think mm -hmm. if from the get-go, you just made her feel heard. So that was great. Yeah. And I think that's super critical, not just like in a couple, but it's super critical when you've had a conversation with one before and the other one is new to the conversation, like to dedicated and like ask her what her concerns were and like where she's at right now is really helpful. Other thoughts? There could have been some prep work before the second meeting. If Katie met with David earlier, she took notes she could copy David on those notes. And then uh, my understanding is that we'll be meeting with your wife in the next meeting. If you would go over those points of interest with her, then that would be helpful in our next meeting. Brilliant. So it's not all about during the meetings, it's also in between. What's the conversation that's happening between David and Dorothea? <clears throat> and how do you, you know, you're right on Scott, absolutely. Not to over talk it. Other thoughts? Kind of going along with that, but I it felt like the main thing that they need is the financial like model of how, <laughs> what this looks like as the whole thing, or if they only do pieces of it and kind of give them a couple of options and how it's going to affect them. Yeah, and, and, and if there was more time, other concerns would have possibly arisen. For instance, I know Dorothea, so I know that she likes to sit on her back porch and look at the forest. Is a ground mounted display going to be in the way of that? Is that okay? Yeah. So there are there, and again, we had 
what, eight minutes, 10 minutes. So it, you're not gonna get to all that stuff. And Katie did a really good job of kind of including Dorothea, but validating David's previous thoughts and, and, and making offers. I could help you with that. I could work up a model, I could do whatever. Well, Dorothea did have an aesthetic concern that wasn't addressed. Yes, what do panels look like on top of the house? Right. Oh, I was I was confused about where the panels were going. I thought Dorothea's concern was panels that were not going to be on the roof, but a separate display. That and is uh, that is a concern of hers. Yeah, right. I I got that. Um, and I was circling back to the um, heat pump and electric vehicle argument in terms of how many panels were used because. What I was understanding is that David wants the heat pump. He wants the electric vehicle. We need all these panels because I want all this stuff. And Dorothea is saying, well, you know, maybe I want to go to Trinidad for the holidays. And maybe I don't want to spend that much money on that. Yeah, so okay. I was trying to address this and discuss yeah. the pros and cons of a heat pump and an electric vehicle, and then work that into the conversation. And if the conversation had been allowed to go longer, that would have obviously been part of the conversation. And then you would have walked away with a couple of action items. I've got to, you know, do the financial analysis on X, Y, or Z, whatever, whatever the things were that you need to walk away with. So if you were to bottom line that conversation, what did each of you take away from it? Let's start with Colleen. Uh, you're muted. Yeah, thank you. Um. Yeah, I mean, I think the I think the main thing that I took away was just how to like the balance of the dynamics between multiple stakeholders and and like listening to both and and trying to address all the concerns. Right, and with time, you could probably actually address those concerns. But it's interesting. Often, I think what's going to happen with us is we will meet with a stakeholder, David, and then later other stakeholders show up. And we have to, to balance all of that. Um, Nicole, what did you see? Um, I just was really impressed with the way she listened and and, and said their names, you know. And yeah. um, I, I mean, I think that's just the key. And it was almost like I felt like it was just a, a conversation, you know, like mm -hmm. a, let's get let's get all of our ideas out here, or what are what are our thoughts, rather than like, okay, this is what you need to do. Uh, Right. Um, Diagnose and explore before you prescribe. I think that's exactly what was happening. I thought that was great. Um, Karen, what did you, what was the main takeaway for you? Um, I just get worried that I, I haven't um, internalized all the data yet and that I'll stumble over the data. And, and Katie did not stumble at all. She just, she, you know, she had the information and just could readily, um, you know, readily give it. You're, I can't hear you, Katie, but I, I think you're giving me a, a okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I just, I didn't, I don't, I need, I need to study it. Yeah, that's what I feel like too, yeah. We're, we're all at the beginning. Uh, to, to think that at this point in time, we're gonna be able to come up with all the answers and hear someone's concerns and jump right in, unrealistic. But the more we do it, this is my experience anyway, the more I consulted, the more I saw what didn't work, which mm -hmm. I wanted to change, and what did work, which I wanted to keep. And that's just experience. That's all it is, experience. Scott, what did you see? Two things. The first one was, I think we need to have clear in our minds what the financial incentives are so that we can verbalize those without stumbling around and look confident. Yep. Just the basic incentives, you know, zero percent, how much and all that kind of thing. The other thing is, is that the fastest way to address a concern is to agree with a client. Now, if the solar array is too big in your mind, then what we could do is size it for your current needs but put in provisions for expansion in the future. Get that off the table so that she's not focused on that and isn't able to take in other information that's farther down in the conversation. And you'll have to negotiate that with David who totally believes that 
we should build a 500 megawatt farm mm -hmm. in the backyard. <laughs> yeah, good point. Cindy, what did you think? Um, what I saw, I, I, I thought that Katie was very smooth. Uh, the whole conversation went smooth, all three. You know, it was just a very easy give and take back and forth, very conversational. Um, and I, and I, these things have already been stated, but I really like the way Katie pulled Dorothea in and made her heard. Um, I, I just, I think that's so important. Um, and, um, you know, and, and, and Katie was right on target with the financials, right? I mean, she, she double checked it with David, but she, David was like, yeah, you're right. <laughs> so yeah. she was actually right, right on target with that, you know. With those financials, Even, you know, and, and we'll we'll talk about this in a, a later session if you all want to have one. But even when you screw up and make a, a wrong uh, assumption or proposal or or say something that isn't true, like it's one hundred percent, but it's only seventy five, um, that can all be addressed. It, it's not the end of the world if you quote a little bit off. It's the end of the world if you say. You can get all this for free and you're never going to have to pay a cent, but um, yeah, which is not true. But, uh, you know, to, to address the concerns and, and try to work with, I, I think Karen was saying, try to work with the two, they're not opposing opinions or concerns, they're, co they're crossing, that's all. So can you find the point between where both parties say, oh yeah, I could live with that. You know, that, that's pretty good. Um, so let's put the stuff on the roof. And yeah, it, <laughs> we may need to do a ground mounted display for a uh, array for our EV. Let's deal with that when it comes because maybe we won't have to do that. Maybe putting in, some, I don't know. There, there's a lot of maybes. Right. Katie, last word by you. What's your I, take? I, I have a, uh, appalling lack of retained information from the last four weeks of the course. But I mean, if I'm going to coach, I'm going to learn it all. I just, I've been busy. I haven't, haven't learned it all yet. But I, I think if I know what I'm talking about, um, I can convince people pretty much what's in their best interest. It's what I've spent my life doing. Yeah. And, and it's a matter uh, of working with them to do that. I may know well, that. You I may know the solution I believe you really, really need, but I'm not going to put that out right away because, and I've run into this a number of times in, in business where we've said, here's a good solution. And the client said, oh, no, we tried that before. It's never going to work. Wrong approach. What are your concerns? What are your needs? Let's work those through. Here's a potential solution. Oh, I've seen that tried before. Yeah. But in your situation, it'll work. Right? Or, or I hope it will, whatever. So it's a, it's a matter of, of working with, not at. I don't know if that makes any sense. Right, but I mean, the other thing I wanna understand, with the, talking about that 12 year old furnace, our goal is to work with the client to find what is acceptable to them to reduce their carbon footprint. Right, and <laughs> do they need to replace their, that, that's a misconception that comes up time and time again. I'm gonna have to get rid of my furnace because I'm putting in heat pumps. And David has already shown us, go below 20 degrees in external temperature. Not true. You're going to need that furnace to kick in. You're just going to need, right. not need might, to change it a lot. That's all. If I said I spent $50,000 on the furnace and I'm not spending money on a heat pump now, then we're going to say, okay, that's fine. Let's work on the other things we can help you with. Yeah, what else, what else could work? Right. So we're um, now a full eight minutes over. I was attempting to end this on time. Um, so I, I hope the tools we looked at tonight were useful. Um, David will be running some more of the more technical financial stuff. Um, and I will offer at the end that there are some really powerful tools, a few really powerful tools that take a little more um, understanding before you can use them. Uh, something called the cycle of reasoning, something called requests and promises, all, all the atom of work, stuff like that. There are actually tools that are as powerful as the ones we we're looking at tonight. They're just more difficult to understand and use until you, well, like Katie was saying, until I understand the data and the background information, how can I, how can I feel really comfortable consulting? So 
that's mm. something we can do in the future, but I do not want to hold you past our time, which frankly, we're already past. So David, I'll Brad, hand it to you. You to have, to, you have to Sorry. find out from Dorothea what her light is, because her light is perfect. So you got to- Yeah, I've been, <laughs> I've been working on it. I haven't found a combo yet. No, but whatever, whatever, she's, whatever <laughs> implement she's got is working. So yeah. I, yeah. Yeah, I got it. <laughs> I've been, Share I've been all struggling of us with this since the beginning. I kind of look like a washed out minion or something. Well, I've got, yeah. My, okay. final, um, my final thought here, I was just, it uh, was funny for me to play this role tonight because in our case, my husband was the one that basically inhibited and said, how is this going to work out? And where is this money going to come from? And I had to come up with a financial plan over five years to make a complete home renovation for the first floor and to get us to the solar panel, which we took a 0% loan out. And it was a, such a thorny road, but I think what's really important is, and I think when, when it comes to couples is, it's always one of the visionary, which is was my role in that case. I had a plan for the house, but my husband insisted on how is this gonna look like every month? What kind of checks are gonna go out? And you have to prove to me what the cash flow is going to be over the five years so that, you know, at any point in this time, if I lose my job, we are not going to be, you know, hit the ground. And it was really important to, to go and to, to acquiesce and to calm the other person in the process. Because when we talk air source heat pumps and solar panels, it's a big chunk of money. And to have that financial spreadsheet that David is uh, going to help us to put together, it's going to put these kind of like um, questions to rest. And that's gonna be the actionable or the road that the, the people or the stakeholders can go with confidence once they see all these numbers come in with the 0% loans and so on. Yeah, and we, have, we will have tools to help with that, the energy audit, the questionnaire yeah. um, and the proposals, the uh, uh, whatever. There, there are a lot of things that, that can help us work with that as fun as co coaches. So well, I think, David, you know, we need to, uh, yeah, Katie. Just to be sure, so, so I assume at the beginning, this, this is the report for uh, actually Nicole's house, but this is, this is what you're going to get from me. You're going to get a bunch of numbers like this. It's, it's the same numbers I started to show you a couple of weeks ago, which is just the, sorry, which is just the, um, mm -hmm. the financials, net present value, IRR, uh, investment uh, for each one of the Fab Four. Um, and, um, and I'm also going to give you this printout, which shows in red, this is Nicole's house in red. The red bars on Nicole's house, the blue bars are an average for homes in New England. So you can see Nicole's house is worse than average on every single dimension. <laughs> oh, dear. And more is not better in these graphs, Nicole. More is worse. But, but, but this is what you'll get. As that's, that's good news, though. She's got potential. No, great opportunity, Nicole. Yeah. Great opportunity. You're, you're music, Nicole. I knew that, though, coming into this. That's why I was like, I'm the perfect person for this, because I know it will save me money. So that's so fine what, with me. OK, so what we're going to do next time is you <laughs> You might be able to see here, under each one, I've written in my comments about what Nicole should be doing. I'm going to blank all that out, okay? So Tear it down and start over. <laughs> no. What you're going to get is this sheet and this sheet, but with no commentary from me. And what we're going to do next time is we're going to discuss this example, the next example, and say, what do we think? What do we think this person ought to be thinking about and what ought to be their priorities if they're going to be economically rational. And then, as Fred has been uh, telling us this evening, that all has to be embedded in this understanding of the client and the client's needs and concerns. Because if not, you come in with this, it doesn't matter how right this is, if they're not willing to listen to you, it's not mm -hmm. going anywhere. We're going to fail to cut carbon footprints because of us, not because of the right answers. So that's why this is so important to put both together. You've got to have the right answers for people. You can't go in there with the wrong answers. But if you just go in with only the right answers, the whole process is going to fail because that spouse is going to show up saying, I didn't agree to any of this. Or there's going to be some concern that we haven't addressed that is really bothering that client. Like I've got a musty basement. How do we deal with that? 
or um, you know, we, we've only got so much debt capacity now. Our credit rating is not that good. How are we going to do all this? There's all those concerns there that if you don't address them, this is going nowhere. That's why I think it's really important to have like the yin and the yang. You need to have like you've got to have the right answers. You cannot go in there like without having the right answers. But you've also got to have the process that allows the client to want to do this at the end and not just say, "Well, that's nice, David," and then it goes nowhere. Mm -hmm. David, I got a question. Um, the volunteers filled out a questionnaire which fed the information for that document that you're talking about. And in the example that we had tonight, the client did not do a good job filling out the questionnaire because they didn't have the information or they didn't work on it. What has been your experience with your clients? Was that something that we're, as, co as coaches with clients, are going to be working on getting all the information to make that questionnaire complete? Yeah, so my anticipation, Scott, is yes, that there'll be quite a bit of time simply gathering the data. Most people don't have this hanging around. I mean, they do and they don't. They have their energy bills. They, they, they sort of know, yeah, I'm spending 500 bucks a month in the wintertime on heating oil, but you really want to get the bills. And maybe they have that, and maybe they don't. Maybe they've got a call their supply company. They've probably got the electric bill, and that usually has a year, so that's, that's pretty good. But then the size of the house, uh, I don't know. Do you have a measuring tape? Like, uh, there's so many questions on that client data form. I think it's going to take quite a bit of time with the client to actually get the right answer. Mm -hmm. Because when you start asking people how many kilowatt hours, they have no idea what you're talking about. And for most of the clients I've actually worked with, Scott, I've done most of that data gathering. But so the, that's what we may be doing with clients. I, yeah. I think that certainly for the first ones, you're going to end up spending quite a bit of time just getting the data out of them. Because if you don't have the data, you can't get the answers. And most people don't know intuitively. Like, no, nobody knows what insulation they've got on their walls. Nicole did not know what insulation had on their walls. Nicole, based off the energy model, you have this much insulation in your walls. Yeah, but you know what? The guy drilled a little hole in in my um, audit, and he came out with some insulation, I think. But it's, I don't know. It, yeah, so, I, so my guess is you've got some, but it's very thin. It's about that thick. Right, like about an inch. That's a... I have to go down right now and put some wood on the fire because I can't keep heating. My house won't heat up in this cold temperature. <laughs> anyway, it's cold. I have to take my dog out. Yeah, I think we've gone way over time, guys, but I thought this session was brilliant. Thank you, Fred, so much. This was really eye opening. Uh, it was great. So, so by next week, I will have these done. Well, I hope I'll have all of these done for all of you. I've done one so far. Um, and... I haven't given you my stuff yet. I haven't filled it out for you. Then, then give it to me, Katie, because if, if I don't have it, I can't do anything. But what I was planning on doing next time is we'll, we'll do these. They'll be with all the, um, all the recommendations taken off, and we'll go through several. I don't know if we'll get through all of them, because we'll there's several. We'll just say, real time, what do you think? So we'll try it. We'll try combining both these consulting skills and these uh, financial skills together to try to make some recommendations for real people in real time. Thank you, Fred. Thank you. Thanks, Fred. Thank you. Thank you. Good Thanks. job, Fred. All yeah, right. Good job, Fred. Great yeah, job. Ne next time, shave before you come to work and then <laughs> si sil silence your phone during the meeting. Okay? Yeah, I'm working on that. Listen, my, uh, I shaved my beard off twice in my life since I was 18. <laughs> Once for my mother and my kid, who immediately said, throw it back. <laughs> and then for my mother-in-law who also said yeah throw it back <laughs> <laughs> okay all right good night everyone good night, good night. Well, thank good night. You. Well, see you next time you well bye, bye.